Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael. I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Uh, we've had kind of a weird schedule over the last couple of weeks. Sorry, <laughs> sorry for that. Yeah, and it's gonna get it's gonna be weird going forward it's, too. Yeah, we were just talking before we went on air about what day we want to do. Obviously, we're doing Wednesday today, but we may make Friday our normal day, right? Yeah, um, it's just gonna kind of depend on how things work out. It's softball season, so you know, <laughs> softball interferes with everything that I do with Michael. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've been through this before, so we'll we'll figure it out again. Um, and we'll get content out to you, uh, as regularly as possible. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I guess this is a good enough intro, right? Yeah. I mean, as of right now, man, there's so much going on in the news. Like it's, Mm -hmm. I was watching the other night. It was like just, and I say so much going on, like so much of it is just absolute propaganda, but like they are shoving it hard. So we got a lot to talk about. Yeah. Well, uh, we're we're gonna be RT tonight, sort of. Um, like literally half of my notes are about things with Russia. So, uh, <laughs> so let's jump into uh, Turkey versus Russia in Syria. Um, this is actually something I know that most people don't really care, but this is something that we should probably be a little bit concerned about. Um, it does make me nervous. Um, so the the basics are that Russia supports Assad, um, who's the leader in Syria right now that of course the u.s spent years trying to remove but has given up now finally sort of. <laughs> Thank- thankfully yeah. um now the u.s then after we mostly pulled out of syria um where we were protecting the kurds to some degree from the turks um we sort of encouraged the turks to um deal with the kurds on their own and Turkey is using the the here air quotes here threat of Kurdish terrorists because they're not much of a threat to Turkey, honestly. Yeah. Um, the Kurdish terrorists as an excuse for a land grab, as far as I can tell. I could be wrong about that, but that's what it looks like to me. Um, so they've moved into Syria along the border to pacify the Kurds or to uh, ensure their own security by creating a buffer zone. To this point, at least, it looks like they're actually creating a buffer zone, not doing the is, uh, Israel-type buffer zone where you you uh, grab the land, call it a buffer zone, and then start moving your people into it, uh, <laughs> which makes it not really a buffer zone anymore. Yeah. You know? but, um, it becomes occupied at that point, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, but the at any rate, there is... Uh, y- you have clashes between Russian and Turkish forces... Um, you know, uh, Russia supporting Assad, um, Turkey fighting in Syria, uh, where the Russians have been invited by the Syrian government to help, um, defend the government and, uh, you know, take care of ISIS actually, um, which is sort of what we were doing there too. After we made ISIS, then we were fighting ISIS and when they got out of hand and, you know. Anyway, we don't One of those deals through. where it's kind of hard to tell wh- which side we're really on. Like, we've kind of been on both at one point or another. <laughs> yeah, we, we've talked about it before. Um, if you want to go back and listen to some episodes, I would love to cite some for you, but I can't right now. Uh, yeah. Pretty much you can do a search for Syria and you'll, you'll get the information, though. So basically what happened was in our attempts to remove Assad from power, um, we started supporting uh, Sunni militias. Um, the you know the good militias in Syria and uh, in, which includes ISIS or what became ISIS and uh, it was the remnants of Al Qaeda in Iraq who had crossed the border they, they were the Al Nusra Front um, well they've changed multiple times but that's the name that you'll most often hear and um, we started supporting them and then they got out of hand and then they were more of a problem and we were fighting on both sides of a civil war in Syria and we were using the Kurds to fight against ISIS. And then we were fighting against the Syrians and the Russians in Syria, even though they were also fighting against ISIS. Anyway, it was a whole big mess. So thankfully we've gotten out of there. War uh, should not be that complicated, by the way. No, it really, <laughs> like, it really shouldn't. 
Um, and, you know, Turkey's kind of playing the same game that we played over there. They're, they claim that they're fighting defensively, even though they're fighting on another sovereign's territory. Right. Um, they, you know, invade and then they call it a defensive war. <laughs> Weird. Um, so anyway, there have been clashes between Turkey and Russia. Uh, there's currently a ceasefire. Um, we'll hope that it lasts. They are trying to uh, ratchet things down. But here's why it's a concern to us. Um, Turkey is a member of NATO. Yes. And there is a mutual defense clause in, of course, the, the NATO. That's like the whole thing about that, it. That's what the idea of NATO is, is if, um, if they call for us, we have to go help. And when I say us, I mean all the NATO nations. Right. Um, and so what you have to start asking yourself is, uh, with Turkey being a NATO member um, and uh, the U.S. encouraging NATO countries to aid Turkey um, in the their fight in Syria, uh, what happens? Like, what are the consequences of a hot war between Turkey and Russia? Yeah. And do we get drawn into a war with Russia in defense of our NATO ally, Turkey, well, as a result? There's no question, at least in my mind. I mean, I don't really know. But it seems to me, at least, that there's no question that Turkey is going to call for us to do that. I mean, it, it would make nothing but sense. Yeah, I think that's one of the unfortunate reasons that they're there. Yeah. And willing to fight with Russia, who they can't go toe-to-toe with. Yeah. Oh, no way. I mean, absolutely. But I think that they're under the, hopefully, from my perspective, mistaken impression that they actually will get NATO support, like yeah. a, an actual alliance, go in there militarily and fight against Russia with them if they call. Well, I mean, what makes you think that they wouldn't? Because even with Other all than the, the fact that we would be in a potential world war situation. Well, a hot war with Russia, you know, they... if. I people, don't, people are going to start picking sides. If we end up in a hot war with Russia, people are going to start picking sides pretty quick, and things are going to escalate in a hurry. Well, I think the real concern is that... Uh, I, all right. I don't believe that all of these think tank military groups and so forth actually believe that you can have a hot war with Russia that doesn't escalate to a nuclear war. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's... They go out there and they say it. They, you know, they're planning for conventional war with Russia all the time. Yeah. But I don't see how they could make any kind of honest assessment about that and believe that it would stop short of nuclear war. It, it'd have to stop quick. It would have to be a short, it would have to be one of those deals where a little bit of stuff happens and everybody kind of realizes, oh, we got to end this now because it's going to get too bad. Because mm -hmm. the longer it would stretch on, the more likely that a country, one of the countries would use them. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to say which one. I mean, because I don't know who it would be. But the more it would it's go It's a toss-up. I actually think it's more likely that we use them first. It's it's entirely possible. I mean, I wouldn't bet against that. Yeah. Just remember, every time this question comes up, that the U.S. is the only country that has ever dropped a nuclear yeah. bomb on an enemy. It's true. Which is all the more reason to think it could be Russia, too, because they're like, well, you know, they've, they've done, done it before. before. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, um, who knows? I Well, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that they'll actually get the NATO support that they expect, though, Turkey. Yeah. Um, partly because they're, they're already not making friends with the rest of their NATO allies in Europe with the whole immigration thing, uh, where oh, they've well, decided to open the floodgates. That. Yeah, um, They're trying true. to use that as leverage uh, for better deals with the EU. Now, on the other hand, the reason they're trying to do that I didn't expect to get into this, but I think this is actually kind of interesting. We're talking about. Um, the reason that they did that is because the EU promised help to Turkey in dealing with the immigration crisis. This also, by the way, is partly our fault, the U.S. fault, um, <laughs> for you know creating chaos in the Middle East and you know the wars that we've the terror war has created millions of refugees. Yeah. And they're all trying to get out of the Middle East. And, you know, North Africa isn't the place to go because it's just as much of a mess. So the best chance is to get into Europe. To get into Europe, you either go through the Mediterranean or you go through Turkey into Greece. Um, and so the EU made a deal with Turkey to keep the immigrants there in Turkey instead of letting them into the EU. Uh, but they promised a bunch of support for it. 
which they haven't really provided. Yeah. And so now Turkey's gotten fed up with that and said, why are we dealing with this huge immigration crisis that they all want to go to Europe? You told us that we, if we kept them here, you would help us out, and you haven't. So you know what? We're not keeping them here anymore. It makes you wonder why the EU doesn't just like give them a bunch of money to keep them. Yeah, well, that was the deal. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, Well, it seems to me like they would want to, I mean, they can just print it out thin air anyway, right? Yeah. Hence to where we're going later. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> Yes, subtle sh foreshadowing <laughs> from Liberty Lair. Yes. Um, so anyway, just uh, I, I would say keep an eye on this conflict. L like I said, it's they're in a ceasefire. Turkey and Russia have had talks, and they have agreed to a ceasefire, and it's holding essentially so far. And nobody's really jumping the gun um, based on the weird militias that are still kind of fighting with each other. But the the states involved haven't really haven't considered that uh breaking the ceasefire so they're maintaining at least yeah. as of this morning <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. it's it's been a hectic day out there again so who knows i mean things could be changing as we speak <laughs> yeah um but it's something to keep an eye on because it could draw us into a, a wider conflict that we don't want to be involved in um and then sticking with russia for a couple more points probably uh <laughs> We have the other conflict between Russia and Saudi Arabia, and this one is an economic conflict. This is related to the oil. So if you've noticed a steep decline in your gas prices recently, it's because of this. Yeah. And so the – and I, I haven't gotten as, to read as much into this as I would like, but basically um, Saudi Arabia and the other OPEC countries um, had agreed to limit production – uh, of oil to keep the prices high because there was a drop as a result of the coronavirus scare. Hmm. And um, Russia said, no, we don't really want to limit our production. Um, we need to keep producing oil so that we can keep making money, etc. Yeah. And uh, so Saudi Arabia said, well, we're just going to open the floodgates. And Russia said, fine, we'll open the floodgates too. Now, yeah. This is a bad move, actually, for Russia, because Saudi Arabia can sustain production profitably, profitably at lower prices than Russia and for longer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what I was talking um, with my brother today. I was like, there's no way the Russians can come out on top of this deal. The Saudis have way too much. I mean, I guess they, they just have more leverage here than the Russians do. I mean, they their capacity is just way more. And they can produce it at a lower price anyway. Yeah. Um, I don't... I think at this point, part of it is Russia doesn't want to be pushed around on this. Yeah. Uh, I think the reason they decided to open the floodgates is they decided, well, we're going to get priced out of the market soon, so we better make our money while we can. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not really sure what the long-term thinking is. Like I said, I hadn't gotten to read into this as much as I'd like. Well, but, the, but that's the basics of the deal. And it, it's good for consumers here in the U.S. Oh, um, absolutely. On the other hand, it's bad for the U.S. In, in, uh, energy industry. Yeah, well, that's that. I was fixed to say the flip side of that is any of these guys that are into fracking right now, like that's being shut down. Like, I mean, once it, once prices hit where they're at now, like mm -hmm. there's, they're shutting all of that down for sure. Yeah. My understanding is that you have to have about $50 a barrel, uh, 50 to $55 a barrel to make fracking profitable. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it pushes down the other ener energy industries too. Like all this green energy that we want, that, like they already can't compete with oil because, or, you know, with fossil where fuels because the they're cheaper. Where the prices were at, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they definitely can't compete with it at $30 a barrel or $35 a barrel or wherever <laughs> it is right now. Yeah. Um, Russia can't maintain this for long. They will uh, end up having to drop their production and OPEC will get its way. And the prices will rise again. So, you know, fill up now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, I did. As soon as I drove past, I didn't even know what was going on. I just saw a dollar ninety six gas and was like, what is going on? Like later on, I got some alerts on my phone about kind of what was happening. But I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Now, the other the other part of this is that this isn't something to be concerned about. This is a cycle. Yeah. This is something that happens. Yeah. Uh, if you'll remember, what, five years ago, maybe, roughly? Right well, around election time. 
Oh, was it? It always seems to fall right. No, it always seems to fall right around election time. Every four years or so, we have a huge drop in oil prices and gas prices go down. Okay, that's interesting information. I'm going to have to double check that. Let me make a note. Yes, make a note. Because I've been trying to figure out the cycle because, you know, you watch it drop and fall. And like the key is to figure out when it when you want to buy your oil futures. Yeah. Because yeah. you know the price is going to go back up. Oh, yeah. It's definitely going to go back up. Um, but you also don't want to get I'm not stuck saying... with a whole bunch of oil that you can't keep in your garage. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah, right. You got to take possession. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like If you can't sell it off, then yeah, that's, well, ex- that's how it works. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm not saying this is going to hold to election time because it may not. But it does mm-hmm. seem like we have a, a serious gas price drop right yeah. around election time. Okay, I'm 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 gonna have to check right. the history on that. That's that's interesting insight. Yeah. Um. So yeah, not something to worry about, but it is it is kind of one of those interesting. This is a this is the result of economic war, actually. Yeah. Um. Well, one of the possible results, I suppose. Uh, now the consumer's winning on this one, at least for a period of time. Yeah. Uh, well, because what's scary though is it could go the other way. Like they could. I mean, I guess it could. I would assume, like, if they can fight over on being of uh, over like overproducing, couldn't they do the same thing with shutting? But that takes more of a conceited effort, doesn't it? Uh, concerted. Concerted. Yeah. <laughs> that too. Yeah. <laughs> um. It. Yes, and that's much harder to to maintain. Um, Okay, so when there's an overproduction issue and it pushes prices down, uh, that kind of levels itself out because people are unable to produce at a profit for the price once it gets to a certain level. Yeah. Just like fracking here. Absolutely. And so at some point they stop producing so much because they can't make a profit on it. And there's only so much of a loss that you'll take to make a point. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, On the other side of it, uh, you just, you get to deal with good old uh, self-interest. So when they're underproducing and they're really driving the prices up, like when they, you know, when prices were getting into the hundred dollars a barrel. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Many years ago, um, people start cheating Like they can work together and say, all right, we're going to limit our production to this amount. Yeah. But when it starts reaching a certain level, people are like, man, I could make a whole lot of money if I just drop a bunch of oil onto the market real quick. Like right now. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And then once one does it, others do too, because they don't want to be left, you know, holding the bags. Exactly. So, um, it's, you know, it's typical market stuff. It's the same thing that you talk about with, uh, with monopoly, how uh, uh, like a truly free market, like a real free enterprise system fixes monopoly on its own. Yeah. Uh, Because the only way you can maintain a monopoly is if you're actually producing the best product at the best price and probably a range of products because there's going to be certain uh, niches that would, would be filled by other, you know, producers. Um, And if uh, so, there's those old stories about uh, Vanderbilt dropping his prices to drive everybody else out of the market and dropping his prices to a level where he was losing money, um, but everybody else was too, and he could maintain longer. Yeah. All right. So the consumer wins on that because eventually he drives everybody else out of the market and he can crank his prices up then because he's the only guy left in the market. Yeah. But as soon as he does, other people enter the Somebody market. else enters every time. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so it, it's the same thing here. They can limit production and drive the price up as high as they want, but at some level, people start producing because they see that price. They see those dollar signs. Oh, absolutely. And, and then once one does, others yeah. do because why just, wouldn't you at that point? Well, absolutely. The pact is already broken. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then on the, the downside, it you know at some level, you just can't produce anymore. Um, and... You can't continue to lose, and yeah. so you stop producing as much. Or you stop. Actually, what they do is they don't stop producing; they just stockpile. They, just they stop stockpile. selling. Yeah. Um, and because they, that was actually the way I framed it to some people after I had kind of heard about what was going on. I was like, "Well, the Saudis have basically started like unloading their supply because I'm sure they've got just supplies." And I'm just kind of guessing. I don't actually know, but my guess would be is they've got just loads of the stuff supplied somewhere and mm-hmm. all they really have to do is just start releasing it yeah. and it'll and it'll affect the market you know so it's not even so much that more is being drilled it's just more is being released into the market yeah 
Yeah, I, I mean, they can actually ramp up production to yeah. some degree, well, too. Well, I'm sure but, they can, but... Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a lot of it. Yeah. And what will happen is that Russia will reach a point where they can't continue to to sell it at a loss, and they'll just start stockpiling until the prices climb again. Yeah, and then, and, there, and then there's your correction, like there yeah. it goes back to normal prices. Right. Um, cause they can't just release it in a glut either. Cause it'll drop the price again. They're stuck exactly. right where they were. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Last Russia thing, probably. <laughs> we'll um, see. <laughs> and this is a uh, U.S. versus Russia on election meddling. Ah, yes. And I'm like, seriously, we're doing this again. I, so, and also just to make a point right from the beginning, like the story that was leaked about, uh, the intelligence agencies briefing the, uh, b- briefing Congress on Russia meddling in the election again to support uh, Trump and Bernie. Yeah. Um, greatly exaggerated. <laughs> well, it's just amazing to me that it just happens to be the two outsiders that they're supporting too. Like, yeah, uh, and they anybody said, that's against the establishment seems mm-hmm. to be a puppet of Russia. <laughs> right. Well, and the way it was leaked, um, they said that it was, uh, you know, with the attempt to, or with the intent, I guess, of having Trump reelected. Yeah. Um, that uh, they didn't want Biden because Biden could beat Trump, and the people that like, I'm just <laughs> yeah. kind of blown somebody away is that. not in tune with reality if they believe that. Because... Well, there's lots of people that lots. Of, apparently, the entire Democratic establishment believes it. Or you could go with the no agenda theory that they're pushing Biden because they they've already given up on this election. Yeah. Um, that it's a well, lost cause. They know it's a lost cause and they don't want to lose all their donors by putting somebody like Bernie or Warren in, up there. I do agree with some of that because mm-hmm. I, I mean, there's nobody in their right mind and, I, and I'm not going to try to make any predictions about Trump over Biden, but nobody in their right mind is looking at Biden like, yeah, he's the guy. That's the guy. That's the guy. Like nobody believes that. I don't care who you voted for. Even if you voted for him, you're not <laughs> like, oh yeah, he's the guy. I mean, you voted for him for reasons, but not those reasons. Yeah. Like, have you heard him do any interviews? Like, I mean, come on. I saw a funny uh, political cartoon um, this morning. Uh, it was a, a guy sitting at a meal and he has a lobster on his plate that's labeled Trump. <laughs> and um, he says, uh, uh, I don't want this this uh, autocratic, old, rich, white man. Um, you know, I'd rather have that one. And he points to the tank behind him. And there's another lobster. It looks exactly the same, except it has Biden on its side, you know? <laughs> yep. Anyway. Yeah, um, and that's what it is. I mean. And then, you know, but the idea is that they're, they're also pushing Bernie because they are sure that Bernie will lose to Trump. Yeah. I Personally, think, I think Bernie has a better chance because he has a charisma that drives people out. That I mean, I mean, in order, in other words, he gets people that'll come out and vote for him. People will yeah. be excited to come out and vote for Bernie, and, and people aren't only, excited to come out and vote for Biden. People are excited to come out and vote for Trump. Yeah, well, and not only that, he takes he takes something away from Trump by the fact that he is. He is an outsider, and he can play that outsider Trump card, and he can take that card away from Trump Mm -hmm. because, like, Trump can play out the outsider thing the whole way through against Biden because Biden's establishment, and everybody knows it. Um, And and Bernie is not. Like, Mm -hmm. even though he's been there forever, he still has that street cred of being an outsider. Yeah. You know? Um, but back to the uh, the meddling thing. Oh, uh, yeah. There's been several intelligence officers who have said that uh, that Pearson, who's the uh, DNI um, person that gave this briefing, apparently um, overstated the extent of intelligence on Russian interference, and what's available does not suggest preference for the for President Trump. Really? Um, that they're just you know trying to sow chaos and. Um, to me, the whole thing is really a, a purposeful ploy by est- establishment U.S. government um, to delegitimize the elections in the U.S. Yeah, that, that's what I think it's really about. Is like, uh, okay, well, you know, we're going to go ahead and create this excuse if we don't get our guy again, and that way we can question it and make sure that the the president that we don't want can't get anything done because we're going to keep, you know, pulling up these uh, investigations and so forth like they've already done for the last four years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. But I'll tell you something. I was talking with some people about this last night, and it's just kind of neither here nor there, really. But four more years of Trump will be very interesting in a situation where he doesn't have to run again. 
as far as like what he would be willing to do and what like just as far as like releasing information and stuff like that. I don't know. Yeah. I think it would be interesting because he wouldn't have at that point. I mean, he's an outsider from politics anyway. I mean, I think he would be a lot more to use their word unhinged. Yeah, and I think it would be awesome. I mean, I think it. Would, I mean, I'm I'm rooting for it. Like, I think it would be hilarious. You may be right. Um, we we'll probably find out. Find out. I hope we do. Like I say. Um, but you know, again, on the election meddling, this idea that they're still pushing this idea that oh, it hasn't uh, Russia interfered with the election in 2016 and is a big part of why Trump got elected and so on and so forth. Yeah, um, I just don't now, think in the second term that's going to play as well. I just don't think that they're going to be able to hold him back the way they have the first term. Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I did want to contrast what we have been given evidence of. Yeah. And I, I just want to also point out that because Russians did it doesn't mean that the Russian state approved it. Yeah. It's well, not as autocratic as it once was. Yeah. Um, if you watch uh, servers almost anywhere, like most of the attacks are from Russia. It's not the Russian state. It's a bunch of, you know, also in their basement, you know, their mom's <laughs> basement, Russian hackers that are trying to get into stuff. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, it's, it's just, just people. It's just what it is. Yeah. But what they actually presented us evidence for in the Mueller report, et cetera, is that the uh, Russians spent roughly $110,000 on Facebook ads in the 2016 election to influence the election. <laughs> All right. And this supposedly, because it was very well targeted, yeah. I guess, um, this supposedly swung the election. Now, just recently, Mayor Bloomberg spent $600 million and won American Samoa. <laughs> it's true. Oh, it's so true. Like, it, it just goes to show you how ridiculous this deal is. Like, there's no way, man. Like, yeah. I mean, are, he you, spent are six, you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, he spent six thousand times as much in a primary <laughs> yeah. um, to try and earn his way onto the stage and he won American Samoa. And, and we're just supposed to believe that he just didn't know what he was doing with all of those. Somebody right. that's able to throw around this amount of money just didn't know how to do it right? Yeah. Like, because believe me, I saw Bloomberg everywhere. I'm in Alabama and <laughs> I saw Bloomberg everywhere. He's on my Facebook. He's on my TV. Like, Everywhere, like <laughs> everywhere he could be on the, everywhere. I don't know. Yeah, it, I don't know. There, I don't know either. There, there's just no sense in it. Um, you need an excuse for why you lost. Yeah, I guess. And that seems as good a one as any, I suppose. Yeah. Well, we just got outspent. It, it amazes me that, so Hillary uh, outspent Trump by a ton, too, in the election. I mean, that, but they keep talking about how you can just buy an election, buy an election, but the evidence is not there. Yeah. Like, yeah. empirically speaking, <laughs> you lose when you spend more. Yeah. Not, it, I mean, that's not necessarily true, but certainly over the last major elections. Yeah. Well, and it, a lot of that has to do with the, the dynamics have changed. Like, the mainstream media isn't what it used to be, and people don't pay as much attention to mainstream media as they used to. Um, and that has an effect because that's where a lot of that money is going towards is mainstream like TV ads and stuff like that. Do you think it's because they're listening to us? Are we influencing the election? Well, I mean, I think you could actually make an art. <laughs> in all seriousness, like podcast and alternative media does have a way bigger impact on the stuff, I believe, than than what your you know mainstream media does. I mean, at least as much of one. But the thing is, is we're not organized. Like, podcasts are what they are, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's not like we're in some kind of organization where yeah. we're like... <laughs> this is the free market of media right here, actually. It's exactly. just a bunch of people out there producing what they want to produce, and they either get listeners or they don't. Yeah, and they, you know, it, it is what it is. But but your mainstream media is all in lockstep, mm -hmm. which kind yeah. of which brings us to kind of what's going on with the coronavirus right now like anybody that's watched any news at all i mean you can't escape it like it is it is everywhere all the time and it is they are ratcheting up 
fear like I have never, well, I have seen before. The only other time I've seen something like this was after 9-11, mm-hmm. at least in my lifetime. I mean, I don't know. Um, people who are older than me may remember other things. But the only other time I've seen the media ratchet something up like this was after 9-11. <laughs> and, and I was more swept up in it after 9-11. I mean, I was pissed. I mean, we all were. Yeah. Um, this is different, and it's, it's scary because this is, it's propaganda at its worst. I mean, and people are buying it. it well, I say, people I run into don't seem to be buying into it, at least not from what I've seen. I mean, most people I talk to are like, are basically feel the same way I feel about it. Like, it's like the flu 2.0, mm-hmm. you know? And yeah, it's something to be concerned about, but not to the level that the media is making it. Yeah. I mean, you say that they haven't ratcheted a, a fear like this. I mean, maybe I have a skewed view of it, but I think they did the same thing with Zika. That was just last year, maybe the year they, before. They did. Uh, it was not like this, though. Yeah. Like it was. I don't was, watch a lot of mainstream media. It was so. in no way, shape, or form like this. Now they mm-hmm. they talked about it and they they did ratchet up. Tiny more heads, than, tiny heads. Yeah, I mean they did a lot of that, but it was not to this level. Yeah. I mean it's it's you would think watching the news that like. Fifty percent of the people that get this die. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, that's the way they make it out. Yeah. And then you look at the numbers, and it's like they're they're like not. I mean, they're just low. I mean, mm-hmm. com- at least comparatively to the flu. And I mean, the survival rate's like ninety eight percent or something. I mean, it's there are people that need to be concerned. I'm not saying I'm not trying to downplay what this is. I'm just mm-hmm. saying the media is overplaying it. Yeah. And that's and, and not just like a little bit because the you you expect the media to overplay things. I mean, mm-hmm. I expect that, but not to this level. And it just makes you wonder what this hurricane's going to kill everyone. Yeah, it just makes you wonder what's really going on here. Mm-hmm. Um, and and what worries me is is that this is leading towards something because what what scares me is is. What what is the government going to try to pull over on this this time? Well, and they've already started it. Um, so I, I'm not sure of all the details of the stimulus package that was just They're supposed signed. to be making announce or Trump's supposed to make a big speech tonight. Um, but my understanding is that it includes a bunch of spending for the overseas contingency operations, which is the terror war stuff. It's like, you know, the slush fund for the terror war or for the CIA, essentially overseas. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, no, it's the slush fund for the DOD overseas because the CIA is getting a piece too, yeah. um, you know, several hundred million dollars. Um, the uh, uh, Department of State is getting a bunch of money. And then all these states that are declaring states of emergency when they don't even have any cases yeah. Uh, yeah. of coronavirus, they're, you know, they're trying to get their hands in the into the pot too. The trip I'm fixing to make just got canceled today. Yeah. So, well... Yeah, and and on top of that, like so, the CDC, I guess it was today or yesterday, came out with that um, they're advising that all of these sports complexes and stuff hold their sporting events with no fans. Like so, I guess like the basketball games and stuff. That's going to be trouble come football season. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that really amazes me is that they um, they postponed the release of the new Bond film. Oh, they did. I did hear about that. And they'd already started marketing it. Yeah, uh, marketing the release. I mean, and like maybe a lot of people don't have a real understanding of how much money this is. Yeah. It is a tremendous amount of money for them that they've already poured into marketing on this thing. And they'll have to do it again for the new release date. Yeah. And so the difference there is what I, apparently they believe that what they will lose in ticket sales if they try and release right now will be made up yeah. if they postpone it and are, and spend this money twice to market it. Yeah. And that's that's a lot of money for a film. Yeah. Now, uh, a friend of mine suggested what they should have done, and I actually think this is brilliant. So we're giving away free advice for all the movie execs that are listening. <laughs> um, is uh, he said, well, what they should have done is is release it on time, but they should have released it straight to pay per view. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, forty dollars to watch it on pay per view or something. They would probably have made you know ten times as much money <laughs> if they released it in theaters. All these people that have self quarantined, they have nothing to do and want to watch nothing. the new Bond. You know, film. actually, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, that could be we could actually now that you mention it, I had never really thought of it that way. But that could be the future of cinema, where they where you don't even go to the movie theater anymore. They just release it at a high expense 
early, mm-hmm. and then as time goes along, the price drops. Yeah. Well, I mean, it could be, but there there's something about being in the theater with the giant screen and the, the sound and everything. They're, you can't quite reproduce that at home They're yet. absolutely... I mean, you have to spend a tremendous amount of money to come close to reproducing that at home. There is. You're absolutely right about that. But at the same time, people are becoming more and more reclusive. Like, That's true. I mean, they, they just... It's becoming almost part of our nature is, yeah. you know, the whole not, not going to the grocery store, ordering your groceries and stuff like that. Well, my it, romantic life is a perfect example of this. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> but you're not alone. Like, yeah. I mean, you're, this is kind of the direction that, and it's, it actually, now that we, I mentioned it, it's not something that's talked about a lot, but the, I do feel like in many ways, the country is becoming more and more reclusive. Um, and that's not good either. And this only feeds upon that. It's never been easier to be a, sh- a shut-in. It really hasn't. You're absolutely right. I can get all my food online, have it delivered to my door. I, I literally don't have to leave my house. I can yeah. actually do almost all my work. Work from home. Yeah. yeah. And you're not alone in that. Like There are a lot of people that are in the same same boat you are you, as far as work is concerned. So, I mean, I'm just saying. And when I get laid off here pretty soon, yeah. this is the only work I have left. <laughs> right? <laughs> Look, we're working from home right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're home, but still. <laughs> well, uh, so there is a, another part of this. That, I mean, they are working hard to try and stimulate the economy. Yeah. Uh, now, actually, we should probably go on. I, I know that what, you, what you'd really like to focus on in the coronavirus stuff is for everyone to beware of your civil liberties that are going to be yes. encroached that's, upon. Yes, that's where I was going with all of this is that we re- – because that's – when I talk to people and I've talked to – quite a few actually about just this subject. They all see the same thing I see, but they're not taking the next step. Mm -hmm. And that's the civil, civil liberties, the, 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 the loss of your freedoms that could come Mm -hmm. from this. Yeah. And Uh, look what's happened in Italy. Yes. I mean, China. Okay. You kind of expect expect it in China, but when you talk, start talking about Italy and some of these other places, and I mean, there was more stuff that just came out today as far as Italy is concerned. I don't remember specifics, but well, they locked down travel in pretty much the whole country. The whole point. country, yeah. I mean, they're shut. It was like stuff a quarter down. of the country yesterday. Now it's like the whole country today. Yeah, and it's 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 scary to me. It's it's terrifying. Like this is and this is something that people need to be aware of. Well, and they've talked about other things. They they've talked about using the um, location data from your cell phone to see where you've been to see if you've been somewhere where you might have come in contact with somebody and like. Yeah. Think about that. This, um, and then you know, of course, there's the the old story. Well, ah, uh, you know, they can't, they don't give personally identifiable information uh, when they. So this is go back to the Snowden stuff and the, yeah, and the clap trap that clapper. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, gave to Congress about how, well, we only collect metadata. You know, there's no personally identifiable information there. Okay. Just think for a moment about how much somebody can figure out about you just by knowing your location at various times of the day. Yeah. First thing, obviously, they can figure out where you work and where you live. You yeah. don't think that's enough to figure out who you are? <laughs> yeah. Right. That alone about, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, you know, various groups that you're involved in, et cetera, et cetera. I mean. Yeah. Us here right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, they're <laughs> planning the raid. I, <laughs> yeah. You know. I'm telling you, man. <clears throat> so uh, this this is a concern. This is a, a significant concern. And this is actually probably the biggest concern of the coronavirus. And this. It is. Oh, that it without question to me, it is. Yeah. Um, and that's what I've been telling people. It's not the virus I'm afraid of. It's mm-hmm. the, it's the reaction. And I already gave you several examples, uh, the, you know, um, DOD, CIA, like I've already given you several examples of how they're using this to strengthen the national security state. Yep. Um, They're using the funds that they're diverting for the coronavirus to strengthen the national security state. Um, And then I can, I I would give really strong odds that in this deal, because there's a bunch of Patriot Act or Freedom Act stuff um, that's, that's coming up that's supposed to expire. Uh, I, I can give you really strong odds that some of that stuff will be renewed as part of the package to fight coronavirus. Yep. Oh, without question. And, and things that we don't want. Yeah. Things that are definitely things infringing are, on your privacy. Without, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is where we, we really need to be careful. You don't need the government to quarantine. No. People self-quarantine. Yeah, we're and, and pretty good at it. Like I said, like we're heading that way anyway. Yeah. Like. Um, and then the other thing is that this is... They're, making this out there 
giving you all these figures, there's going to be 15 million dead or what, you know, all kinds of just insane. And I, I say that knowing full well what I, what I'm saying, yeah. insane projections of the number of dead and so forth. Um, because what they're doing is they're taking the current rate of in, infectious, uh, you know, of infection, of spreading, yeah. um, and applying it forward. But that's not how infections work. Yeah. Well, they don't work that way. They climb rapidly, they reach a plateau, and then they drop off. And that's already happening in China. And yeah. it'll happen everywhere else that the virus is spread. There will be a, um, a you know, they're like a, they're kind of a bell curve. Yeah. Right? So they, they climb very rapidly, they level off, they drop. This is how infections spread. This, this is mathematically true. You can look at epidemiology stuff all over the place. This is what happens. Yeah. And it's not something to be concerned about. It will not continue this rate of spread. Yeah. It well, will not. And the, it's the same thing as Al Gore with the hockey stick graph. Right. Where he's just, where it's just like, well, what's no, gonna... that was completely made up. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, but yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you take these projections and just start projecting them out and mm -hmm. not take in any other factors. And that's where you end up. Right. So, um, so, you know, just pay attention, beware. Please, like, and, and tell, and talk to this about other people, like, get this word out there, pay attention to this, like, this mm -hmm. is such a big, to me, this is, this is so scary to me, like, you just don't even know, man. Like, yeah, but not because you're afraid of catching the virus. No, not because of the virus, but, but because of the infringements. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what I'm afraid of. That's, that's what, that's what scares me, man. Um, okay, well, we've got a, a few more topics to try and get through. I mean, we can All push right. some of this off, but, um... As part of the coronavirus oh, yeah. thing, I forgot we were gonna. I forgot we were. Even, well, we talked about it before the podcast, and I, and I even hinted at it. And I done <laughs> forgot. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get we'll get to modern monetary theory. Don't worry. I see it on the list. I'm looking at it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before we get there, because this seems like a jumping off point, it, as part of the coronavirus, the the loss of economic, um, what I guess. Uh, expansion? No, we weren't yeah. really expanding anyway. But well, I don't know. Um, like the Dow, like has taken a beating. Yeah. Eh. Well, I mean, Michael you know, whatever. Are still doing fine. <laughs> yeah, uh, but they are. <laughs> <laughs> um. So anyway, uh, Trump as part of a economic stimulus package to deal with the coronavirus, um, and he certainly wants to keep the economy from completely crashing. Although he's got the excuse now. Yeah. Um. But this is the this is the only way I see him losing the election is a real market crash. And by the way, I think the media and the 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 media and the Democrats. But I repeat myself, know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, 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 I posited this theory you did. on our uh, interview with Mike Meharry. Absolutely, you um, did. But uh, he's now pushing for the, the suspension or even elimination of payroll taxes. Yeah, I heard To that. stimulate the economy. Yeah. Now, first off, I am 100% behind this. <laughs> right. Let's stop those taxes. Now, if you would just quit spending, too. <laughs> right, that's the other side of it. There's, there's... We would be okay. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, so I came across this statistic, though, that I, I found interesting, and it kind of illustrates the, you know, the kind of push and pull between the production side and the consumer side economists. Yeah. Right. And most real economists are production side, by the way. But yeah. mo moving on from that, um, they were comparing it to the stimulus package, the, the like one time stimulus checks that they put out in uh, 2011 yeah. um, after the crash in, in 2008. And they said of the $100 billion in one-time stimulus checks mailed to 130 million people in 2000, oh, sorry, it's 2008, um, up to 90% got spent, uh, according to 2011 research on the program's impact. Um, smaller sums tucked into weekly paychecks in the form of a payroll tax cut were spent at about half the rate, um, and uh, the rest was saved or applied to debt. And they say th they're looking at this as a bad thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Good night, man. That's just that's so insane to me. <laughs> yeah. Um. And like I said, this illustrates the the push and pull between the production side and consumption side. There's a, a significant group of people out there that believes that the more people spend, the better the economy is. And it's like this complete misunderstanding of what what capital savings does. Yeah. Right. The, the reason that economies expand is because of capital savings. You take your, your savings and then you spend it to increase production. Like yeah. you save up what you got and uh, okay. So, um, 
uh, oh gosh, Bob Murphy. You know Bob yeah, Murphy, absolutely. right? The economist Bob the economist, Murphy. Yeah. Um, he has this example that he uses. He, he's got the the Robinson Crusoe example. All right. And he says, okay, and I'm I'm going to screw this up, so I apologize. You'll it. put your twist on it. How about <laughs> I, that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so he says Robinson Crusoe, alone on the island. Um, he spends uh, his whole day collecting coconuts to eat and drink, right? And um, he needs ten coconuts. And so, the, and that's how many, or he can take down 10 coconuts a day. Yeah. All right. And he consumes those coconuts. And uh, so, but what he, he, he decides that at some point that he, he can get by on eight coconuts. Yeah. But he continues to debr- produce 10 coconuts. Yeah. All right. So he takes down 10 coconuts a day, but he only eats eight of them. Or he only consumes eight of them. So he puts two aside every day. Yeah. And after... You know, three and a half weeks, we'll say, to make the numbers round. Um, after 25 days, he's got 50 coconuts saved up. Woohoo! Retirement well, time. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so what he does is, instead of collecting coconuts for the next five days, he fashions himself a pole with a loop. Yeah. Ah. And so now, he doesn't have to climb the trees and, and do all that stuff. So he, he consumes his savings of coconuts during that time so that he can produce... Um, a technology to improve his production. Now he can produce 15 coconuts a day. Yeah. All right. Still only consuming eight. Right. Um, but now he can go back to 10 and still save five coconuts a day yeah. so that he can build a ladder. Who knows? You know, I mean, but <laughs> yeah. the, the, so he can expand his coconut <laughs> industry. Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, you know, and that that's kind of the point is that capital savings is important. Like people being in debt is not good in the long run because yeah. it limits their expansion in the future. And if you want a co- an economy to grow, you don't do it by spending money. You do it by saving money and then investing it in it and improving your productivity in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I say that with absolute certainty. I mean, that's it. That's how it works. Like, I mean, that's, I, I yeah. don't see any other way for it to work. Yeah. And, and just think about it if you just take out one factor or the other, right? Yeah. Um, if you say that uh, the way to improve an economy is to consume, 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 yeah. well, why don't we just make everybody consumers? Yeah. Right. Start just printing money and giving it away. Yeah. And, and letting everybody, and yeah. If nobody's producing anything, but that's gonna that's gonna get really difficult really quick. It's hard to consume when nothing's being produced. Exactly. Um, now, if you if you do it the other way, like you can make the same argument, right? Like, oh well, if everybody's yeah. producing, well, well, no, not necessarily. That doesn't mean that nobody's consuming because they yeah, have to consume. They have to consume. Yeah. But if everybody's producing, then you know, then you got a, like a good barter. Everybody's kind of exchanging services. Yeah. Well, I mean, then it's it's balance in the system. Like you want just this. There needs to be balance here. You know. Mm-hmm. But but to force it to to even think that people are paying off their debts is a bad thing. Yeah. Just the whole thought process behind that is just insanity. Well, and that leads us. I mean, that's Keynesianism mostly. Um, and uh, but it and I'm going to use that to go into the you know the concern about Bernie. AOC and the like, and their modern monetary theory. Yeah. And this has gained a lot of traction because governments love this idea. Oh, yeah, they do. Um, and so basically, uh, the idea in modern monetary theory is since governments create their own money, they can never be insolvent. Yeah. Right? Um, and so debt doesn't matter. Uh, you, If you have a bunch of programs that you want, like let's take the Green New Deal as an example. Yeah. Costs so much money. Yeah. Okay, no problem. We'll just print the money to cover it. Yeah. 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 We'll print the money to pay for it, and um, and then that'll be fine. Well, then, I mean, like, even the mon- modern monetary theory people say, well, you do have to be a little concerned about the, an oversupply of currency um, causing inflation. Inflation, yeah. That right? was... And so they say, oh, but that's no problem, because the government can then tax the people to pull that extra money out of the economy <laughs> and limit yeah. inflation. Yeah. So there you go. So what happen, What happens here is yeah. the government prints money so that they can spend it at full value. Yeah. Um, eventually it trickles down to the rest of us plebes. Yeah. And it's not worth as much because inflation is already trying to take hold. But don't worry. 
the government will then take that money away from you to prevent that inflation from getting out of control. And guess who's going to pay them their taxes? Yeah. And but this is also assuming this is my favorite assumption about it yeah. is that the government collects those taxes so that they can pull that money out of the economy to limit inflation. Yeah. So they'll they'll what? Destroy that money? Oh, you, no. They you, spend it. Because yeah. guess what? The debt's are already so insurmountable anyway that there's no way they can tax their way into paying it off. I mean, and the, the stuff, so the stuff I was seeing, because I looked into some of this today, and um, is that, that debt just doesn't matter. Like, that was the argument that, that I kept seeing when I was um, reading and watching videos and trying to wrap my head around this idea, mm-hmm. is that 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 just doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter how big there's no sense. All of these people that are talking about controlling the debt and all of that, that that's not a worry that all we're worried about is, is, is inflation that that's so when, so when Congress, so the argument I heard was, so when Congress decides they want to spend X amount of money on whatever the project is, they need to consider what that's going to do to the inflation and never mind the debt that debt doesn't matter. Yeah. So, it, but it goes back to your last point with, um, well, if the government's debt doesn't matter, why does my debt matter? <laughs> well, because well, oh, this is the other thing. I thought this was funny. Okay, so you keep the value of the currency by creating demand for the currency, and the way you create demand for the currency is by taxing, because you can only pay in that currency, and yeah. so that for therefore you have to have that currency to pay your taxes, yeah. and that creates demand for the currency to keep the value up. It seems like all this really would do is make people want to move more and more towards Bitcoin or gold yeah. or some, something that actually has some value. T- something that actually has some value to it. Well, th- that's what I see as the the major problem with this idea uh, is that the whole thing rests on the idea that that government, not markets, create money. And we we had a podcast about this before. Yeah. There's a difference between money and currency. Currency is a representation of money. Yeah. Um, it's essentially like a, an IOU. It's, it's supposed to represent something that actually has value. The, the value, the thing with value is the money, not the currency. Yeah. So government can create all the currency at once, but it doesn't create money. The market creates money by, um, okay. <laughs> the market <laughs> creates money by having a, uh, a, uh, commodity that is easily tradable and that has value to pretty much everyone. It, it is just a medium of exchange. Yeah. It's not something that that um, it, it's not something that is anything on its own. I, I mean, like yeah. it has to be something on its own. Actually, yeah. that, I'm so I, I said that completely backwards. It has to be something that has value on its own. Yeah. Um, that people will want because of what it is, yeah. not because of what it represents. Yeah. Um, and it just happens to be uh, that it. Like the way markets create a money is by having something that's easy to carry around, easy to exchange, usually easily divisible. Like there's a whole bunch of things that need to feed into it, but it's something that everybody has some desire for at some level. And it becomes something that stands in for regular barter. Like, okay, if we use golden as an example, um, I have chickens, you have cows. Um, I want to trade you 50 chickens for a cow. You're like, I really don't need chickens because I got chickens at home too. And I say, okay, well, how about this gold? And you say, yeah, I'd like that gold. I don't really have any particular need for the gold, but I know that I can trade it to the guy down the street for uh, access to as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, because it has value to somebody in the market at such a level that you know you can always exchange it. Yeah. Exactly. That's where money comes from. Currency is just a representation of that. If you look at old currency here in the U.S., it you know there were like silver notes and mm-hmm. uh, and gold notes. They were essentially things that you could take to the bank and trade in for for a, for a, a precious metal. precious metal. Yeah. Um, and the reason that people did that or that banks issued those kind of currencies yeah. is because it's easier for people to carry around the paper than to carry around the metal. Yeah. It was also safer. Yeah. Um, but you know, gold's heavy. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have enough silver to cover something really valuable, 
it's, it's heavy really too. heavy too. Well, I remember stories of my grandparents when they owned businesses and stuff, like having trunks full of silver dollars. Mm-hmm. Like that's they would they would literally it would like weigh the car down. Yeah, like it would they would have so many of them and they would transform them to and from the bank. Just mm-hmm. di- they at different times they'd have to transport those things. Yeah, and they and, and, th- and you know talk about debasement of currency. Um, I'm not really sure what a silver dollar is worth now. I bet it's about fifteen dollars. Oh, yeah, something like that. Can you imagine what that is? Because that's what I always think of when my dad tells me these stories. It's like, man, like, can you imagine like what that'd be worth now if you had that trunk full of silver dollars? <laughs> yes. Um, and so, you know, it rests on some other kind of fallacious ideas as far as I'm concerned, too. Like this idea that um, increasing government spending increases GDP. Yeah. Well, that's true because that's part of how they measure GDP. Yeah. But does that actually, is this actually a measure of a healthy economy? Yeah. Um, if the government is taxing you, so that, remember, government doesn't produce anything. Right. So everything that they spend, they had to take from you first. Yeah. Right. So if the government is um, spending a tremendous amount of money, trillions and trillions of dollars, we don't know any governments that do that, but, <laughs> you know, if they're spending trillions and trillions of dollars, is that actually improving the economy by trillions and trillions of dollars? Is that actually a, a, an example of a healthy economy, of growth in the economy? If the government spends, so the U.S. government spent something like four and a half trillion dollars in 2019. If they spend five and a half trillion dollars in 2020, does that mean that the U.S. economy grew by a trillion dollars? Not in the current situation. All else being equal? <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, absolutely not. Because what they had to do to get that extra trillion was either print it, and yeah, which is what they inflate did. Inflate away, yeah. um, borrow it, yeah. and you know just pass that cost down to a future generation. Um, or they had to take it from you. They had to yeah. tax it. Yeah, exactly. Those are the only three options. It's the only way that government makes money. Yeah. They either print it, inflating the currency and making the value of your savings less. Yeah. Um, they borrow it, and that just makes it, uh, you know, um, it makes your children and grandchildren responsible for that debt. Um, or they take it from you right away with taxes. Yeah. That's, that's it. Those that's, are the only those, options. That's what you got. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that they're, you know, the, them saying, well, you know, government spending, inc- uh, you know, it expands the economy. I, I think that that's fallacious to begin with. Um, because what it really does is it takes money out of people's savings. It takes p- money out of investment in the future. Yeah. Um, it, it actually hinders the economy m- more than it helps it. And, uh, and like I said before, capital savings is what funds economic growth. Yeah. It, it is what funds future economic growth. And if you're preventing people from saving, you're preventing people from expanding the economy in the future. The government does not expand the economy. Individual investors do. Yeah. So that's that. <laughs> so if any of fun. you, I mean, like, you know, I'm trying to think of people that I know that might be on board with the modern monetary theory. Like, uh, Carter, if you've got answers... To, to this, please contact me, man. Send me a text, give me a call, whatever. Yeah. Like, I, I'd be happy to discuss it. I um, think I think this one would be a fun one to have him on the podcast for. Just say it. Yeah. Like, just just to discuss this because... He might not believe this. I don't know. Well, I don't know. It would, <laughs> he, I don't know if he would or not, honestly. But on, when, so when I was doing my research on all of this today, I was telling Mike before the podcast, like, I researched... Four arguments for mon- like the people I didn't research the against I researched the people that were arguing in favor of this and I just I can't it, it did I answer them all you oh, well yeah without <laughs> question and it it just it doesn't I it yeah I I couldn't because I, I wanted to come on here today and argue for it against mm-hmm. you and I just there was no way for me to do it like I didn't yeah and maybe and. In my own ignorance, I'm not the brightest all the time. Like maybe I just don't understand it well enough to argue for it. But I just I don't understand how you can do that. Yeah. Like, well, how- I mean, I recognize that I may not be giving it a fair shake. I really tried. Like I, I, well, I did the same kind of thing. Like I read up on it, what it's about, and and I just don't know that I can that I can be fair about it because to me it rests on so many just like farcical ideas to begin with. It's just on such thin ice. Every every step of it is just on thin ice everywhere you go. And I I just feel like it assumes too much. So I don't know. And who knows? I mean, it's... Who knows? Yeah, you know, for the types of arguments with uh, increasing government uh, spending increases GDP, therefore economic expansion, 
like I said, this is how these terms are defined. I don't think yeah. that that's actually an argument. Yeah. Um, I, I, to me, it's, you know, it's a whole lot of, uh, e even the things that are arguments that are like legitimate equation, economic equations that they're using where they plug in extra money for government spending or whatever. And, it, you know, it increases total value or total wealth or whatever. Yeah. I mean, correlation is not causation. Yeah. I, it seems to me that you can make the same argument on the other side. Well, if you increase savings, that also increases the economic, yeah. I mean, you know, so it doesn't mean necessarily that one causes the other. Well, when when I was doing my looking and stuff today, the, the thing that I kept coming back to and the thing I kept thinking was, this is how you end up in Venezuela. <laughs> like, I mean, seriously, like, that's where I kept coming back to. Like, like this is a setup to end up like Venezuela, except mm -hmm. for the world. Because it, it, it's one of those deals, if we go down this road and it fails, mm -hmm. the entire globe is connected to us in such a way that, that it'll, bring the, it'll bring everybody down. Yeah. Um, I would say if things actually worked that way, the governments around the world would not be so afraid of things like Bitcoin. Yeah. Now, personally, I think yeah. that Bitcoin rests on nothing, too. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the reason I didn't. I mean, I brought up Bitcoin, but I also brought up the metals and stuff, because mm -hmm. I do think that that Bitcoin's a little flimsy. I mean, at least there is like a equation around how it's created or whatever, mm -hmm. but it doesn't actually do Scarcity anything. Scarcity does not well, that's create what, value. That's what I was fixing in to and say, of itself. Though, is just because it was difficult to create doesn't give it a purpose once it's been created. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's that's my understanding of Bitcoin. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's hard to get. Okay. But it's not, you can't do anything with it. Like, yeah. you can't like make jewelry out of it. Or exactly. You know, I mean, so. Um, you know, gold doesn't tarnish. Doesn't yeah. bond with anything. Yeah. It's um, also pretty easy to manipulate. Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, pure form. It's super soft. Yeah. Um, anyway. Mike loves some gold, guys. I'm just saying. I'm a bit of a gold bug, but... <laughs> So. Well, uh, we had one more thing, but we can definitely push it off. Uh, we're over an hour, I think, at this point anyway. So Yeah, I feel like we had a lot to say this week. <laughs> yeah, well, it's because we haven't really done a podcast in like three weeks. Not, I mean, a, we did not the, like this, yeah. And I, I'm glad we could get you guys some quality audio, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this time we'll see after I stop the recording and actually like listen to the first couple of minutes to make sure everything came through all right. Cause it's been a while since I set everything up too. Yeah, um, right. but, uh, gonna you know, pull it up and it's going to be like the car. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. I hope you guys understand we were on the road last two podcasts. I mean, yeah. we're recording in a hotel room, which is not really meant for, ideal, you know, high yeah. quality sound. Um, and then we were recording in a car, which was even worse. <laughs> yeah. I had to choose between, uh, um, having windshield noise the entire way or making us sound kind of hollow by pulling all the windshield noise out. I decided personally that the windshield noise was way more annoying to me. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you guys would have preferred the windshield noise, uh, tough. Yeah, no, there's, I, well, I heard it too. There's no way I could have put up with that for a whole <laughs> podcast, listening to it. Like I would, I would have got a little quick. <laughs> um, hopefully we got you some quality content out anyway, though. And, uh, and we'll be back kind of to normal so we'll be doing wednesday or friday i guess going forward yeah. um uh you know uh liberty larry's got some things going on so i may have a guest host from time to time we will see how all this works out um i gotta work out some tech stuff to make that happen anyway so and it'd be good to kind of get on the ball with the tech stuff anyway yeah because once once we have the ability to skype we've got some potential for some amazing guests yeah so yeah, absolutely. I don't want this to turn into an interview show. No, I, I don't either. But it would be it would be nice to periodically have some. Unless it's you interviewing me. <laughs> well, we do that every week, right? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we'll be back in uh, a week or so, yep. um, depending. And uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, uh, follow us on Facebook, Podbean, iTunes, subscribe. Like and share. Tell your friends. Uh, we have really cool cards now. Yeah. Um, so if any of you are local and want some cards to hand out, certainly let me or Liberty Larry know. We, we've got... Um, hopefully we don't have enough. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, we can get yeah. more. There, the... There's some scarcity. So I'm hoping to create demand just based on the scarcity. <laughs> just based on the scarcity. There you yeah. go. I like the way you think. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we'll be back in a week or so when we finally get this right. In the meantime, try and stay free. Train how you fight.
Tchau. Later.